Morning all. Morning. Morning. How good are you guys? What a vibrant church. It's so alive. Beautiful soul service. And you know, I was here about um, two months ago. Do you recall having the Advent brass here? Yeah, I took the lesson that time. So a little about myself. My name is Rick Jolfs. My beautiful wife Edna is here. Uh, we are members at One Turner Church. We both own and operate a building company, Rick Jelf's Custom Homes. And I'm the manager and she's administration, which means she's the boss. She lets me make some decisions. But um, it's actually quite wonderful. I, um, I spend the mornings on the building site, different sites, and uh, she's in the office, and then in afternoons I'm in the office and she gets her nails done and whatever she wants. <laughs> Some of you um, who are a little older would remember the 1967 film, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner? Who remembers that? Yeah, <laughs> let me just get this set up here. Sydney Poitier and Catherine Horton. It tells the story of two young lovers who have become engaged. And they travel to San Francisco to meet her parents, played by Spencer Tracy and Catherine Hepburn. There is the memorable scene where Catherine Horton, the, the young woman, a beautiful, blonde, young woman, is telling her mum about her fiancé. Well, he's smart, he's handsome, he's a doctor. When the door opens behind her and in walks Sidney Poitier. Now, Sidney Poitier is an African-American and in 1967, Beautiful young white women didn't marry African American men. The camera focuses on Catherine Hepburn as her expression transformed from one of absolute joy and bliss to complete dismay. Guess who's coming to dinner? And the scene is entirely memorable. It's one of cinema's great moments. Yes, he's smart. Yes, he's handsome. And yes, he's a doctor. But there's a problem, and a mother is completely stunned. Have you ever been to a dinner party where something is just not quite right? Um, you're expecting to have friends there, easygoing conversation, and everybody's happy and lively, but something's wrong. There's a tension in the air. And some of the comments that are being passed from one to the other are a little bit edgy. There's an elephant in the room that nobody's talking about. So Jesus had arrived in Bethany six days before the Passover. And he stayed with his friends, Mary, Martha and Lazarus. In Mark chapter 14, verses 1 to 2, I read this. That should be going up on the screen. There it is. It was now two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, this was a special Sabbath. Two important events were going to be occurring on that Sabbath. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him by stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. They're trying to get him but they can't wait until he gets to the feast because the people loved him and that would cause a problem. So the chief, peace, chief priests and the Pharisees wanted Jesus dead because of his powerful preaching and miracles that he had, had wrought amongst the people and the influence that he had. But the Sadducees, they wanted Lazarus dead because... The Sadducees did not believe that there was any such thing as a resurrection. And so the fact that Lazarus was alive 
was a testament to their false beliefs. So in order for each group to maintain their influence with the people, they had to capture both Jesus and Lazarus away from the feast and kill them both. The religious leaders had hatched this plan. And in John 12, 10 and 11, so the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. Hard to believe, isn't it? It was therefore no coincidence that just two days before that important high Sabbath, a group had come together by invitation to Simon of Bethany's house. Who's this Simon of Bethany? Now there's two or three Simons in the New Testament. Matthew and Mark call him Simon the leper in Bethany. But Luke, recalling the same account, calls him Simon the Pharisee. So he was a Pharisee, but he was, a, he was also a leper. As there was no cure for leprosy, and as contact with lepers was forbidden, Simon must have been healed by Jesus, or there's no way he could have had that crowd of people in his house for a feast. The Gospel of John also mentions a Simon, and that's in John 12, verse 4. Then said one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him. Judas Iscariot's father was named Simon Iscariot. Now go to John 13, 26. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. I can see a thread here, and I hope you can too. Jesus had come down from Galilee for the feast, the high feast. This was the feast where they would take him when he was in the Garden of, uh, of Gethsemane. On the, possibly the Thursday evening or maybe the Wednesday evening, two days before the feast, there's a, there's a special dinner in his honour in Simon's house and Judas, his son, is there as well. It's no coincidence that at the same time they mention the plot to kill him. There's the dinner in Simon the Pharisee's house. It's a setup. There's an elephant in the room, and Jesus knows it's a setup. Simon of Bethany and Judas, his son, were originally from Kerioth in Judea, and the name Iscariot means man of Kerioth. And the name Judas is the Greek name for Judea. So these were the, these were the elite, the Pharisees. Bethany was the Turek of Israel, three kilometres only, short walk from Jerusalem. All the disciples and Jesus were Galileans. Now Galilee is in the northern part of Israel. That part of Israel had been taken by the Babylonians and later the Assyrians. And what the Assyrians particularly did was they moved a lot of the population out and moved in people from another community and usually it was people who were enemies with the people of that land. And so this creates a situation where they can subjugate the people. And it's also the case that the Romans who came into Jerusalem and occupied the place, were they, the Romans had a system and a method of choosing soldiers who were the enemies of the people that they were occupying. Deliberate. And so this is why Matthew in his gospel goes to a great deal of trouble to say that Jesus, his father was, his father was, he takes his lineage all the way back to Adam because Matthew had to prove that Jesus was the son of Abraham. 
He wasn't the mixed race Galilean, even though that's where he came from. <coughs> Bethany was in Judea, about three kilometres from Jerusalem. A lot of Pharisees lived there. It was the place to be. And they could trace their lineage uninterrupted all the way back to Abraham. And this is why John the Baptist says, or they said to John the Baptist, we have Abraham as our father. And he said, don't, don't tell me you've got Abraham as your father. It means nothing to me. The scripture says of Jesus, could any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Nazareth is in Galilee. So it's no coincidence that Jesus comes down. He's invited to a feast. How does the invitation get to Jesus? Well, Judas is Simon's son. Probably came through Judas. In Mark 14, 1 to 3, if you could just take your Bibles, please, and open up to Mark chapter 14, verses 1 to 3. I'll just give you a moment to get there. Rustling pages, clicking apps. Now it was two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him by stealth and kill him. For they said, Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. And while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon of the leper, I won't read the rest, that's when they sought to kill him. Now Simon must have been made aware of the chief priest's plot. He must have been part of that plot. You see, Simon had been a leper. And the Pharisees would have rejected him. One way to cement his relationship with the Pharisees and to get himself back into a, uh, uh, the community is to deliver Jesus to them. He likely put his hand up. He likely said, I've got a plan. I'll get him to my place because I know he's going to come down and stay with Martha and Lazarus and, and Mary. I'll get him at my place and then you can do what you want with him. Jesus, of course, is the guest of honour at the feast in Bethany with his disciples and Judas, of course. And Lazarus was invited because A, he was talk of the town and B, because they wanted him also. He was the big sensation. Martha was invited. She was there to serve the food. But her sister Mary was not invited. Mary wasn't invited to this feast because she was a sinner. And Simon would not have her in the house. However, she's known in the gospel for choosing the better part and sitting at the feet of Jesus. She's the one to whom Jesus said she had chosen the better part and Martha, you're so worried about so many things, don't worry about that. Sit and listen to me. But Mary was not a good girl. In fact, it may have been her who was the one who was caught in adultery and thrown at the feet of Jesus in the temple courts. The Pharisees knew that Jesus was a friend of this woman and her family. And so they had set this thing up in the temple courts for a, to, to kill a couple of birds with one stone. Number one, they'll say that Jesus is a friend of sinners. He associates with the wrong type. He can't be a prophet. Number two, they'll get rid of this woman who was a problem to them. Do you think Simon the Pharisee was amongst her accusers on that day. Of course he was. The lady who wrote to the church thinks that he was the very one who led her into her life of promiscuity. What a wicked web we weave. And she had become an embarrassment to him. 
And this was how he was going to solve the problem. All with one stroke. He's going to get Jesus, he's going to get the woman, he's going to get Lazarus, and he's going to put himself back in esteem and association with his Pharisee friends. And so the sabre rattling has begun. Everyone has decided where they'll stand. Priest, Sadducee, Pharisee, itinerant preacher, all made their stand. For three and a half years, it had been backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. On two or three occasions, they've already tried to kill him. All the players are set for the gunfight at the Glen Rowan Inn. They've all got their armour on. One shot's fired, it'll be bedlam. Welcome to that awkward feast at Simon's house. So the meal proceeds as Martha serves the food and the other women. The conversation is polite. Then subtly, at first, but uh, quickly, the aroma of a beautiful perfume invades the room. It becomes stronger and stronger. In Luke chapter 7, verses 37 and 38, I read this. If you wouldn't mind, please, just opening your Bibles and reading that with me. You can take this one down from the screen if you don't mind, Mr. Techie. In Luke chapter 7, 37 and 38, And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, this is Mary, brought an alabaster flask of ointment, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. In Hebrew society, guests reclined at the table. That is, the table was low. They did not have chairs, they had cushions and rugs. You, 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 you lounged with your feet away, uh, with your head toward the table. And so she was able to move in, in the darkened part of the room, without being noticed. There was probably lights on or above the table, and the outer edges were, were not well lit. She snuck in, and she went about what she planned to do. She thought she could do it undetected, but she didn't reckon on the aroma. Judas notices, and his response is heard right across the room. In John 12, 4 and 5, I read this. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, the author notes, said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? A labourer's day's pay was one denarii. 300 denarii is approximately a year's wages. A labourer today might get seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 a year. So this is a pretty pricey ointment. Pretty pricey ointment. Do you think Jesus, oh, sorry, Judas cared about the poor? Of course he didn't. Like his father, he cared about climbing that ladder. As the son of a Pharisee, he was the one with the trimmed beard, the fine robe, the straight bearing, educated, well-spoken. He didn't come from Galilee. He saw the possibility of advancement in Israel's promised destiny of greatness. And he was planning to be part of the expulsions of the Romans and the realisation of Zionist future. And he thought that Jesus was the one to do that and he saw himself as his general. But Jesus said, Foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. 
Judas, are you sure you want the life that I'm offering? We're not going to be hanging out in the fine houses of Turak discussing fine points of doctrine with your father's Pharisee friends. There's going to be plenty of times when we sleep amongst the woods, when we wash in the brook, when we're hungry, when the purse is empty. You sure you want that, Judas? <coughs> Judging by your clothing, are you sure? But Je Jesus turned to Judas and said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you can do good for them, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. Just one detail. Where do you think she got 300 denarii to spend on ointment? A good girl wouldn't be able to get 300 denarii together. So there's an, an awkward silence in the room. Someone's just dropped a bombshell. Sydney Poitier has just walked in the room. And the knives are out. Everyone is nervous. Simon also notices the woman, and I read this from 2 Spirit of Prophecy, page 375. Simon the host, who was a Pharisee, was influenced by the words of Jesus, Judas, sorry, and his heart filled with unbelief. He also thought that Jesus should hold no communication with Mary because of her past life. What a hypocrite. Please turn with me to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, verse 36. Luke chapter 7, verse 36. <clears throat> now the Pharisee who had invited him, Simon, saw this. He said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. A certain moneylander had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, 500 denarii, a year and a half's pay, and the other 50, a month and a half pay. When they could not pay, he cancelled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one I suppose for whom you cancelled the larger debt. And he said to him, you've judged rightly. Then he slams the trap shut on Simon. Then turning to the woman, he says to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house, you gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears. And she wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss. But from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Very bad host. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. And the part that he left unsaid was, your sins are not. But he did say, but he who is forgiven little, loves little. And in Matthew 26, 13, I read a very, very powerful statement for G from, uh, from Jesus. Truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Without this kind of commitment, your religion is just religion. Without giving it all, 90% won't do. No thanks. 
nice of you to offer? No, I want it all. I want the 300 denarii ointment on my feet. All of it. Simon, you didn't even give me a kiss. But what's the message here? That she spent a lot of money on ointment? She gave everything. In Mark 10, 14, then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he sought an opportunity to betray him. This is the first of two meals that occurred in quick succession that Judas rudely walked out of. Halfway through this meal, when Jesus had rebuked Judas, Judas walked out. He went to Beth to uh, Ju uh, Jerusalem, three kilometres from Bethany, and gave up Jesus. Then he waited for an opportunity. When was the opportunity? The Last Supper. He walked out of that meal halfway to, through also. And how would Jesus possibly know where to find the chief priests and the Pharisees in the middle of the night in Jerusalem? He'd only just come down from Galilee. There's only one way he could have known, and that's if Simon, his father, told him where they would be. Judas, when you make your decision, they'll be in such and such a house. Jesus knew that Judas would betray him on the day he met him. Three and a half years previously. Have I not chosen you twelve? But one is a devil. At the Last Supper, Jesus says that the one who would betray him would be the one who dips his hand with mine. What do you think is the significance of that? Now, how many of you have been to a lunch and there's that last piece of savoury there and you've got your eye on it and you reach for it but someone on the other side of the table puts their hand out at exactly the same time. Now I know you people are very polite. You take your hand back, you take the plate, you offer it to the other person. And the other person will probably say, oh, I'll go your halves. That's the Aussie way, isn't it? No, not Judas. He will dip at the same time as this Galilean because he's a Judean. Later he leads the uh, soldiers to the appointed place in the garden and he betrays his Lord with that infamous kiss. So what do you think is the significance of a kiss? What a strange way to betray your Lord. The kiss that Judas gave Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane was the kiss that Simon did not give Judas, Jesus at the feast. It's the kiss of contempt. It's the kiss that says, don't you come down here from Galilee preaching to us Judeans and insult my father and me in our own house and expect to get away with it. Please turn with, with me to Matthew chapter 21 and verses 28 to 33. Matthew 21. Matthew 21. What do you think? A man had two sons and he went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterwards he changed his mind and went. And he went to the other son and said, said the same. And he answered, I go, sir, but did not go. Which of the two did the will of the father? They said, well, the first. And they're right. 
Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom before you. Why? They gave the right answer. The reason why the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom before them is even though they gave the right answer, they had the attitude of the second son. All that the Lord has said we will do. Not good enough. Don't say I'm going to do it, then don't. Or don't say oh, I won't do it, and then don't. Or whatever they said. But Mary represents the first son. She had the, she lived the life of sin, but then changed her mind and came to the Lord. She will go into the kingdom of God. And what she has done will be preached wherever the gospel is preached. But the second son, I go, sir, but did not. They represent the Pharisees. They had the right theological answer, the first son, but they had the attitude of the second son. How often we can sit in Sabbath school and come up with all the goodies, but then Sunday morning or Monday morning at work, hmm, I'm in the building industry. I know what rough blokes can be like. I have to deal with them every now and then. But they did it not. And this is the difference between Mary on one side and Simon and his son Judas on the other side. One has got saving faith through grace but one has got religion. The seeker of the grace of God and the self-seeking. The substance of saving faith and the forms of religion. You know, outwardly, we would choose Simon and his son every time well-dressed, well-mannered, educated. They could be elders here in our church. Mary, not so sure. But what does it say? Truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what Simon and Judas have done, no. What Mary has done, we preached in the whole world in memory of her. That means to me that what she has done is equal to the gospel. What she has done, or what she did, was what God wants from every one of us. Turn up here with your religion if you like. You know what? Come with your faith instead. That each one of us is represented by one of these two characters. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Each one of us is represented by one of the characters in this story. We were all there. Maybe you were one of the disciples too intimidated by those Pharisees to, to even speak. Maybe you were, maybe you were a Mary. I hope so. I hope every one of you was a Mary. I hope no one was a Judas. But we were all there. Are you the one who put everything at Jesus' feet? Because that's what he wants. Dear Father in heaven, we offer this service of preaching, of singing, of learning to you. We're here this Sabbath day, Father, because we love you. We recognise our shortcomings, like Mary. But we know, Lord, that you will accept us the moment we bow our head and the moment we, gave, we give that offering to you. We offer ourselves, Father everything, our thinking, our doing, our speaking, 
our associations, our work and our church. We give it to you. And we ask that you will take it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.